welcome everybody to the uh, West Grid Town Hall, the next West Grid Town Hall. Uh, I'm Patrick Mann, the uh, Director of Operations of West Grid. I'll just share my screen. Good, yeah, so West Grid Town Hall, there, there are three of us presenting today, myself, uh, Ikenna, our new senior developer, and uh, Alex, as usual, will talk about uh, upcoming training events and such. So, a uh, little bit of admin end of things here. Uh, you can use the group chat. That's usually the easiest way if you want to ask questions, but feel free to uh, just break in and, and uh, ask as we go along. Uh, usual uh, note that uh, please mute your mic unless you have a question. It's uh, really handy to uh, stop uh, video from bringing up whoever's uh, making a noise on their keyboard or something. Uh, I see we got about 20 or 22, 23 folks. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll give my usual updates on Westgrid uh, racks coming up. So we'll and operations. But uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, that Ikena Okpala from uh, from our development team is going to talk uh, pretty briefly at a town hall about uh, what the development team is working on and what they're doing. And then at the end, we'll we'll do the uh, the user training. I'm going to go through this uh, Westgrid Compute Canada kind of thing reasonably fast since uh, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing, uh, hearing what uh, Ikenna can tell us. So a few things have been happening since the last uh, town hall, which was, uh, what, back in June sometime, I think. Uh, so first off, uh, I'll just do a, a bit of a national update. This is the Digital Research Infrastructure, DRI, the new organization. You might recall we've been keeping people up to date as we go along that uh, back in a year and a half ago, uh, the federal government announced uh, half a billion dollars for digital research infrastructure. And the approach was to create a new organization uh, that, uh, uh, that would spend some of that money. Uh, and this new organization, uh, as a note, seemed to have something like 375 million now. That's been uh, approved by the Ministry of Science and it will have three uh, components, the research data management, uh, advanced research computing, so that's the stuff that Compute Canada does right now, and then research software, which at the moment is, uh, is being uh, uh, mostly managed by Canary. So this new org will take those, those three chunks. Uh, over the summer, a, uh, what's called an applicant board has been appointed that's the board that will incorporate the new organization and set up the basic bylaws and governance. Uh, and then they will uh, create, then, then once they got everything organized, all the admin stuff essentially, then they will appoint the real board uh, and uh, they'll have, have developed some process for that. Uh, that's supposed to happen sort of before Christmas, up around Christmas. So we should have the, the full board and the organization running uh, somewhere in, in the winter. That'll be great. And then they can start doing their strategic planning around what to do with 375 million, which is, uh, which is great. Uh, I noticed that last thing, I'll just point it out, that uh, according to their website, that's engagedri.ca, uh, they are going to set up a set of consultations in the next month, starting next week. Uh, uh, that's, that, that's great. I think the announcement only came out two days ago. Uh, so a number of us will try to attend and, uh, and uh, see if we can, we can uh, make our input. I've, I've written down what's on the website there, the New Org consultations, Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, Halifax, and then two in the West, Saskatoon and Vancouver. So certainly if you're there or around, I think it'd be well worthwhile. Uh, as far as I can see, these are supposed to be full morning consultations. They'll work for, for a morning each. Uh, so uh, I think keep an eye on that, that website if you're interested in where New Org is going. We certainly all are. There, if you're interested, is the uh, applicant board, four members, uh, uh, one one researcher and uh, some fo focus on uh, on public sector uh, projects from uh, Ernst and Young, uh, pr president from University of Saskatchewan, and Laurie McMullen, who's the uh, executive director of Cucho, 
the Canadian University Council of Chief Information Officers. So I think that looks like a pretty strong uh, applicant board who are there, say, to put the whole thing together. Oops, sorry, went backwards. Right, and then following on to focus down a little bit on Westgrid, I'm just going to do this pretty quickly. But uh, but uh, Lindsay Sill, our CEO, is uh, is moving on to. Uh, I think she's uh, looking for more challenges, or different challenges at any rate. Uh, and uh, and so the Westgrid board is recruiting a CEO, and that should uh, come out very soon on our on our web page. Uh, and I'll just note that next week are our Compute Canada and Westgrid annual general meetings are in Calgary. Uh, and uh, we've been working away on mission, vision, core values, and strategy and action plans uh, as the new org comes in and as regions like Westgrid uh, think about where they're going to fit within that whole new org. Uh, so uh, these kind of uh, planning uh, times and AGMs are, are they're getting very interesting. Uh, I won't go any further than that right now because I don't think we're set to, to provide a lot of that until we have the AGMs next week. One thing I really do want to talk about then is, is RAC, the Resource Allocation Competition. And uh, a just a quick overview, I think we did this back at the, at the last uh, uh, town hall, but just remember RAC, we, we're, every year it increases. It's pretty much a linear increase at the moment, just moving up every year. We get a lot more. And, uh, uh, and not only do we get more RAC applications, but they ask for more. So the uh, the red line there is what we got asked for in 2019, and that's what we had, and that's what we allocated after reserving some for default use and uh, RAS. So it's a huge difference going on there in, in CPU. We only, uh, I think we allocated something like 40% of what we were asked for. And GPUs were terrible, 20% of what we were asked for. And they're just, they're, they look like they're going up exponentially. So demand is huge here. Storage allocations, again, that, that last year we didn't have enough storage. We bought more. So that was great. Uh, we happen to have some money. I think we're probably going to be kind of okay in storage uh, in, uh, in 2020, but it'll be tight. And I'll mention that this, this really good news is that last year, uh, the CTOs and Compute Canada made a strong case for transition funding. We talked about these kinds of numbers and noted that it takes us a year, maybe a year and a half or two years if we're going to do full RFPs and big architecture and consultations, uh, user consultations, to get new gear on the ground. So we said uh, 2020 was the really important rack. We just didn't know. And we made the case. Uh, so I said over the summer, uh, made the announcement that they're going to invest 50 million in an immediate expansion of the infrastructure at the five existing national sites. So it is transition. We're not going to have more sites, not going to do anything too exciting, except to spend 50 million plus match on new stuff. So this is fantastic. I don't think that's going to be enough to bring us uh, to be able to... Uh, 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 work with with all our asks, but it'll certainly sort of, I, I think, double maybe our capacity, especially GPUs. We'll have to spend lots of money on GPUs. So great news. We don't know the details yet. Well, the sites do, but that's not public knowledge, unfortunately, through uh, through ISED. Uh, but we should be, uh, we should know much more in the next couple of months, I think. So keep an eye on the Compute Canada website, but that's fantastic. There are the rack key dates, just to put them up. Uh, the uh, RAC starts next week with submissions. Uh, the submission websites open up, and you got to get everything in by November 7th. So uh, the usual stuff, start working on the RAC. Uh, Compute Canada will have two Q&As, one in English, one in French, in early October, October 8th and 9th. All this is on the Compute Canada website. So as usual, I recommend you go there. And I'll just, one slide here, note that there are some changes going on here. Uh, we've had a, a big look at the evaluation criteria for RAC because uh, the scientific reviewers, and we have upwards of 150, 200 reviewers, uh, uh, they were not very happy with the, uh, or they, they had some criticisms about the, the 
the uh, fine-grained approaches that the old ways had, and uh, and we're having some troubles trying to give half scores and that kind of thing. So we've made some changes there. It's probably, I mean, these are the scores that are going to be given to your applications. So it's probably a good idea uh, to have a look at some of that. And it, uh, and I have a uh, best practices. Uh, slide deck, which I will be giving in the next uh, few weeks, I think, and uh, so keep an eye on that. Well, I'll go over some of this in in detail. The the management plan. You're supposed to have a management plan now uh, for whatever you're working on, and there's no HQP section. That's a big change. Uh, that gets gets integrated into the management plan. So we really want to know that the team that's doing the work uh, knows enough, has the expertise. If it's a major team, maybe the governance structure too, to uh, to handle whatever the project is. Uh, and then I, I just note the last one that uh, HBC for Health in Ontario uh, have have uh, allocated some resources to Compute Canada. That's a secure cloud where you can run extremely secure jobs on their cluster uh, in an environment which uh, which is created for a job and completely cleaned out after the job runs, uh, plus, of course, partitioning and such. Uh, so uh, uh, that's great. There's not much there, but if anybody's got uh, some use for such a very secure cloud approach, then, then uh, keep an eye on those uh, uh, on the rack process. Uh, moving on, any questions there? I'll just see if there's anything coming in on the chat. Nope, nothing there. Yeah, then then uh, a quick review of some of the operations going on. Uh, Graham and Cedar had uh, power outages toward the end of August. Uh, I think uh, Graham down in, uh, in in Waterloo, there was a big storm, and Cedar just seemed to have something wrong with their power supply, a short brownout, but it did take the, uh, the jobs out. It, it did take the cluster out. Uh, otherwise, looking down, uh, Cedar had a huge outage back in July. Uh, that, uh, as I think everybody knows, uh, uh, the the big single point of failure for all our systems is the shared file system. So when the shared file system goes down, essentially the whole thing goes down. We can lose a few nodes here and there, but not not the shared file system. Uh, so, uh, and and Cedar's file system has oh, sorry has been having issues uh, for. Uh, actually, almost um, about a year now. It's uh, it's uh, both uh, both hardware and software issues. And July 21st, there was a a big outage to replace some of the storage controllers, uh, and that was not a good thing because uh, uh, even though uh, the uh, Cedar guys worked directly with the vendor, uh, the system did a whole file system recheck all by itself, and that's a uh, that's a couple of days for traversing a 10, 12 petabyte system. And it turned out that some of the new parts were actually defective. Fortunately, the Cedar team found that, and they had to be sent back in the emergency uh, uh, replacement of those parts. Now, so that took, uh, that took days. That was a problem. However, uh, it looks like it's made a difference. Uh, it certainly looks like Cedar's uh, stability on some of those systems are, is, is, is much better than it has been. Uh, Beluga, that's the new uh, Montreal system, Quebec, Calcul Quebec system. It's have, uh, it just came up uh, back in the spring, so it's having some teething problems, and again, all around the shared file systems. So they seem to have continual scratch and project times when they're unresponsive. Uh, we're not too involved with Calcul Quebec, but, uh, but uh, they're certainly working on it. Uh, and Niagara had uh, just one outage to put in an emergency power generator, so they're going strong. And the cloud's doing great. Our viewed us at UVic, uh, a couple of little networking issues, but otherwise uh, going strong. There will be an outage next week to do some upgrades in the external network. Uh, so this is the, the usual thing that you can't actually get into. Uh, into uh, Arbutus occasionally when that external net network has a problem and they're updating some of the gear to fix some of those, those issues. But otherwise, going strong. It's nice to see. I just note a little bit about, about Cedar. I talked about that July 15th to 17th. That's the DDN 14,000. That's the, 
the big storage controller from Direct Data Networks, DDN. Uh, and one point just at the top is that the other problem, as usual, with all of these systems, I think I mention this one all the time, is that if jobs perform extremely intensive I.O., and that usually means a very large number of small uh, file accesses, uh, then you can bring the system to, a, uh, to its knees. Uh, that can just, just hammer the, uh, uh, the metadata servers. Uh, that was happening with some real problem jobs. Uh, from that were being submitted from slash home. That's not a good idea. Slash home, remember, is the little file system that's there for sort of keeping track of your source code and, and that kind of stuff, and you should be submitting from scratch. So uh, Cedar a bit of, uh, disabled uh, job submission from slash home. Uh, sorry about that, but uh, so, so you'll have to follow the, the more uh, uh, formal approach of making sure you've got your job all organized in slash scratch and then running jobs from slash scratch, not from slash home. It's, uh, I, I think it was getting, getting uh, just too easy to be a bit slack and not following the procedure. And the uh, Cedar guys noted that they, right now there's, uh, there's an issue running Singularity container uh, software. Uh, when you exceed the memory request, the node fails, but not only that, for some reason it also hangs the file systems. That, are serving executables on the node. So uh, that's a nasty little issue, and I gather Singularity knows about it and are updating, and we'll update it as soon as we can, or at least have some way of uh, looking at that, but careful on memory requests. Right, so that's kind of it for me, and uh, yeah, I'm really pleased to be able to to uh, introduce our development team, which we've been building up over the last couple of years. Uh, what we've seen is a huge increase in the requirements for what are called RPPs, the research platforms and portals. And you've seen that. That's one of the programs in RAC. And uh, we have begun to help researchers develop these RPPs. Uh, the issue, of course, is that uh, uh, we don't expect researchers to know all about modern development practices in how to write these things. And I can't talk about that. So. Uh, We've got Ikenna, he's a senior developer with tons of experience. Uh, we hired Stephen Buchholz earlier this year as a junior developer, and we've uh, had uh, some interns. We had interns last year, and we've got one intern remaining for the, uh, for the uh, uh, autumn, term, uh, autumn term at Courtney. So, Ikenna, kind of over to you. Thank you, Patrick. Can you guys see my screen? Uh, I can see your screen, but not the presentation. Yeah, there it is. There presentation it is. Yeah. Not there. yeah, cool. Um, yeah, just like Patrick said, uh, the the talk is mainly going to be around uh, describing some of the you know the you know what are some of the practices you know characteristics methodologies that we at uh, Westgrid are using at the moment to kind of support uh, you know researchers in their work. Uh, myself, uh, my name is Ikenna. I am a developer here at um, Westgrid. I am also I also have uh, Steve and uh, the wonderful Courtney, <laughs> who's also in, in our team. And together we are building solutions that create, extend, implement, and maintain scientific gateways. And also we support a lot of advanced computing uh, software tools and databases for researchers. Um, right now, you know, we have some space, and if you're considering a, pro uh, a project, uh, please just give us a shout at support at westgrid.ca. Um, our team mainly, uh, we, I would say, the characteristics that we, we have developed over the last one year uh, is that we are looking very well organized and self-organized. I'm, I'm actually, I can speak confidently to this because I think my, myself, Steve, Courtney, uh, we, we, we are self-organizers. We, we, we are self-starters. And over the last periods, uh, through our decision-making processes, I would say largely by consensus and, on the, and, you know, we are all agreeing and getting work done. And irrespective of absence of a team member or anything, we've we've been making we've been you know 
covering milestones. Uh, we have been developing largely in an iterative manner uh, in two week long sprints. Uh, normally we start, you know, with a discovery process, uh, but as you would know, not everything is always ideal. But ideally, we we would prefer a kind of a scenario where we have we have a discovery process. We talk to the um, um, subject matter experts and the users, and that way we can then build a, a backlog, and then that's how we kind of progress and get that into like a two-week sprint cycle. Our engineering practices, uh, we have built one monolith and a microservices application currently in the works. Uh, most of our deployment strategies and most of our development strategies, we, we actually like prefer communication over protocols. Uh, and a lot of uh, restful, um, in, uh, you know, data interchanges. And at the moment, we are building our continuous integration and continuous delivery uh, systems. Um, for in terms of our daily, you know, how does our day really start? Um, we we kind of start with daily standups um, uh, at the beginning of a week of a one of the of a two week uh, cycle. We have like a planning meeting where we kind of plan that out. Um, at the moment, that is being done mainly on the CC status side um, in a very self-organizing way. Uh, at the end of two weeks, we have show and tells where we kind of show what we've, what we've kind of built over the last two weeks. And then we have a retrospective right after where we kind of talk through like what went wrong, what went right, what went well, give ourselves a pat on the back, uh, you know, talk about ways that we can improve. And largely, um, I would say my, myself and you know the, the Steve and Courtney, uh, we are in that stage right now where we've realized the benefits of what test-driven development is actually going to bring to us, and we're kind of getting that in. Uh, at one of the key points from our last, last retrospective, which was raised by a team member, was you know, pair programming will be good to kind of keep going, you know, to start it and then get going, you know, using that as a way of knowledge exchange and also sharing ideas. Uh, domain driven development, just like I mentioned in the previous slide, this is an aspect that we're looking to further develop uh, and we, you know, uh, with subject matter experts where we can then sort of like mirror our architecture and our software, software components uh, to kind of, kind of mirror what the domain is actually, the language of the domain, basically. And then as a very small team, as you can imagine, uh, to him, much is given, much is expected. Uh, but to achieve this, we are big proponents in our automation. So we have a lot, we have a lot invested in Ansible and Terraform and the likes so that we can reproduce these environments uh, very fairly quickly. As you can see, I have a diagram of, you know, sort of like the agile process, how we kind of iterate through it. And I'm hoping further down, I would get some questions to kind of further go into it. Um, here are some of our tool sets, uh, our spanners and hammers, if, yeah, for lack of a better term. But uh, on the front end, we do the standard HTML, uh, Bootstrap, uh, React.js, Moment, uh, jQuery on the back end, we were using a lot of Python. Um, I see our, I see us evolving more as a Python shop. Um, we're, we're, we're gradually having a lot of time invested in Python, developing a lot of stuff in Python. So I think the future has is looking more, um, how would I put it, uh, more towards the Python side with Flax, Django, and things like that. We do have expertise. We can manage Ruby on Rails projects, Java, if need be. Uh, on the DevOps side, we're doing, like I said, currently now we're in the in the middle of a lot of automation. So we, we have developed a lot of expertise with Terraform, Ansible, and Concourse CI. Uh, Compute Canada sits literally on OpenStack. So that's kind of like, uh, you know, tools that we, we're using at the moment. Um, projects that we are, we are working on, uh, we are contributing to one, one of the main ones is the CCDB project uh, where we are part of the national team. Uh, mainly we just get allocated tasks there and we just kind of do them. Uh, on, you know, for CC status, we have literally taken the, you know, taken everything by the scruff of the neck and we're, we're building uh, it. We've built it in, you know, 
in the whole in the entire stack. Uh, this application, I would I will be talking more in, in the next slides, uh, but we, it's due to be delivered in the fall of uh, 2019. Uh, Resistance DB is one w which we're very proud of because we've worked together with the guys at U Calgary, uh, offering them technical support and guidance, and also full stack development. Um, here is a screenshot of the CC status app. Um, mainly CC status is just an alert and notification management system. Um, one of the good things uh, about this um, building this uh, system was that it was started by co-op students. Uh, one of the things I really believe in is that anyone can develop software and it's, it's, uh, it's a thing of pride that uh, these guys have gone in and with very lit little um, you know, exposure to like the real world, they've been able to bring out something that is functional. Um, so you can see the names and the credits to Steve, Christina, uh, Courtney, and Devon. Uh, the last three are actual, um, they're no longer, well, sorry, only Courtney is with us. Uh, Christina and Devon uh, have left, they were co-op students. Christina was the year before, and Devon was just this uh, summer. So, but uh, Steve was, a, was a also was also a co-op student. He's now, uh, he has now joined us. As, like I said previously, this is a full monolith application. I'll, I'll talk more about this down the line. Uh, here, we also have a, you know, the resistance DB project. Uh, this is with, as I mentioned earlier, is with the University of Calgary researchers uh, at, the Lu uh, Ian, at the Lewis uh, Research Group in University of Calgary. Uh, mainly, this is just, um, 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 you know, uh, with, with what resistance DB is at the moment is that we are sort of like curating three major components. Uh, metabolomics, proteomics, and genomics. Uh, and as you can see, the diagram here just kind of shows you the workflow that we are trying to build. We're trying to build. It's not finished yet, but we have actually delivered the uh, portal uh, where we have the uh, metabolomics interpretation tool, uh, you know, organism classifier tool, where you know we the researchers can upload their MZXML files and literally get a report of what, it's, what that MZXML file contains. Um, overall, our apps we, or our websites, the architecture that we mostly uh, are going for is more of a microservices architecture, which, you know, this um, image here is trying to display. So we mostly look at things from you know, separation of concerns from the front end to the back end. Uh, one of the major advantages of this is that it encourages, you know, communication over protocols. And that way we can sort of like adapt to change. Because uh, one of the major disadvantages of having a monolith application is that when it's time to kind of, uh, you know, use the latest and greatest uh, um, libraries and tools out there, you're kind of you know, so much, you're, you're kind of deep in, you know, I, for lack of a better term, spaghetti code. But by separating the front end and the back end, um, what you're doing is you're kind of leaving your um, business logic to kind of live behind. And research has shown that 60% of the core of your application is always going to be in the business logic area. And then the user interaction rules or activities and things, validations and things that you want to kind of enforce on the user end, just put them in the, in the front end side. So this is sort of like the way um, ideally we like to build, but we also understand that look, these things, you know, we might pick up projects halfway into, you know, it's life circle, or we might pick up legacy projects. But ideally, this is kind of like our idea of how, you know, the best way that we can kind of manage uh, software projects in its life cycle. For RESTful endpoints, we prefer data exchange through JSON. Um, and, you know, we try as much as possible to kind of build things in sort of a way that where we can sort of like, you know, uh, so that it be a little bit flexible. Um, I'm just going to go in quickly and just do the, a demo. Um, can everyone see my screen? Is that is that showing? Hello, is that? Hello, can anyone hear me? Yeah, looks good. Sorry, I had my oh, yeah. screen's fine. Oh, okay, cool, cool. All right, fantastic. I just wanted to be sure that <laughs> that didn't uh, take away anything. Um, 
Right. So uh, what I'm going to be demonstrating here is just a simple, you know, way uh, we, we've created through Ter Terraform to kind of just create a, a VM that kind of can host uh, a website or, you know, as you can see here, we have the uh, continuous integration VM. But here I'm just going to quickly just, you know, go in and... Uh, and, and just to note, uh, again, that, that was on the Arbutus cloud, right? Yes. Yeah, that, that was on the, the Arbutus that cloud. That was the dashboard yeah. to the cloud, yeah. Yeah, yes, so. exactly. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's on the Arbutus cloud. Um, so basically, well, I'll just source that quickly. Oh, man. Apologies. <laughs> Uh, meant to do apply because I did um, destroy it previously. But what this is actually doing at the moment is literally building a, a a server based on the rules that we have here. So rather than have like you know forget what you know how you've uh, configured your server or each time you know having to resize things or having to do things in an arbitrary way. Um, you just detail out all the rules, your you know your communications over the ports, the ports that you want open, and things like that. And basically, you know you can always reproduce these things. So one of the main advantages of things like this is, say for example, something goes wrong, just like um, Patrick mentioned in his talk, like a file system just gets overrun or something like that. These things happen. Uh, you can easily just go in and just write this. Um, you know, write this script and maintain it over time, uh, make modifications when you want, and then literally Terraform will help you sort of like maintain, sort of like maintain a history of how these things have uh, changed. Now that it's finished now, if we now just uh, refresh the page here, you can see that the website one has actually on everything it's supposed to do, it's allocated the IP address and all that. Now the second stage would normally be that I would run the Ansible script, but for lack of time, uh, that would take a good 30 minutes uh, to kind of run, but um, I'll just kind of show you the, the script and just get it going here. And it will just go in and um, yeah, you know what that is. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so the demo gods are actually with me today. Um, so yeah, so basically that this is what this uh, script is actually doing right now is literally going in and provisioning all the Ansible stuff. Um, we call this project the RDB boxing, uh, you know, just that the, the what the term we, we came up with. And what it's, what it's done is it's divided into basically two layers. Uh, the playbook, which holds the Ansible rules and, you know, roles and things like that. So we kind of, this is like a self-documenting kind of script where we know at every point what our VMs and our servers should look like. Um, now, this holds, this now comes to the aspect of, you know, how would this, how would you maintain this over time? Um, this is where the team needs to be disciplined in the sense like, you know, on you know, making sure that um, whoever goes into the server, logs into the server, kind of you know makes you know holds that uh, holds those rules intact and not meddle too much in these in you know in the in this configuration of the server. Um, yeah, I I, I trust yeah, this is going to finish up properly. Uh, I'm just going to head back to my slides and you know move on to the. Next things, uh, right. So now, what are the next things that you know we're looking at to achieve at Westgrid with the software development team? We will continue to contribute to the Westgrid community, supporting the Westgrid community. Uh, continue also with our involvement with the Compute Canada CCDB project, uh, contributing to open source. We 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 have this idea of kind of a lot of the. Um, libraries we are finding in, in the Flux community that do not exist. We're looking to kind of um, go into that and provide those libraries. And also open some, sourcing some of our libraries as we, as we uh, uh, create them. Um, the, uh, we're, we're looking forward to kind of seeing what, you know, you, you guys out there 
have in store or need help with. Um, and you can always contact um, Patrick and you know he, he will take it from there. Um, thank you very much for uh, you know, your patience and listening to me. Does anyone have any questions uh, based on what I've said so far? Yeah, thanks, Akena. I, I saw that there was one question. Uh, just on yeah, the cool. on, on on the chat, just as if you'd been working with Felix and uh, Fortin at uh, uh, you know in 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 Calco, Quebec there, uh, yeah. and I just I just noted that that uh, in fact both you and Steve are working with the with the Compute Canada teams. There's the middleware team and the mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and yeah, Felix was on those teams, and there's some really good stuff happening with those guys too. And, yeah. Uh, we, yeah. Yeah, we, we're, we're generally, um, you know, collaborating with all the uh, developers across Compute Canada, um, especially through CCDB. I think that's where we kind of have a lot of interface with a lot of the other developers. But it's also good at, during um, tech, we get to meet with other developers as well. Uh, myself and uh, Steve and Courtney, we were all at the last... Um, yeah. Um, event. Um, so yeah. So we we are working across. You know, depending on what's on the table, really. Um, but at the moment, you know, our major focus is the West Grid community. So uh, here, you know, if you've got anything that you want some, you know, us to look into or kind of help you out with, uh, we're more than happy to kind of have a look in. Yeah, thanks, Akena. And, and you know, I, I'll just cool. mention one other thing that that resistance DB project that Akena was he, he focused mostly on the uh, uh, on the uh, the approaches from the development team, the development approaches. But the project itself is really quite fascinating. Uh, Kenna alluded to MZXML files, but uh, in in practice, you've got a blood sample from a patient in a hospital, and the the uh, the patient may have some infectious uh, some infection, bacterial infection. And uh, the uh, at at the moment, if you want to culture a blood sample and work through an identification procedure, it can take days. Uh, and and as you probably know, some of these resistant bacteria, the superbugs, can be really dangerous and uh, and and can in fact kill you within a day or so. Uh, so this approach takes that uh, blood sample, uh, does a quick culture, and then dumps it into a mass spectrometer and uh, and chromatography. Uh, equipment uh, and they produce data uh, which is this MZXML file which then goes into a machine learning pipeline which tries to identify the bacteria and that's what Ikena was showing us uh, in the in the website where one can upload some of these uh, these data files from from the mass spec in particular and come out after applying a machine learning model uh, t with uh, with an identification, and if all goes well, give or take a, a few years, uh, th this can become part of uh, clinical practice, which would be uh, would be fantastic. So this is a cool project to try to build that, to, to work with uh, with researchers who are building, for instance, the machine learning pipeline, and know their equipment and and how to handle these things, and we're helping them build this uh, build the the gateway into that. Uh, so anyhow, pretty exciting project, I think. Pretty cool. So thanks, Akena. Yeah, and good luck with that project. Thanks. Thank yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yep. Uh, so great. If there, is, as Akena said, uh, give me a call if you've got any projects that that you'd like some help or straight consultation on. We're we're happy to work at different levels at the moment since we're just building the uh, the team up. I think this will become a little more formal and we'll be uh, 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 checking, for instance, all the racks and see. Uh, who's working on projects and whether we can uh, we can help them out so we'll get there yeah so uh, then then our final section uh, Alex our uh, visualization and training coordinator and he'll uh, cover some of the uh, some of the upcoming events okay. over to you Alex um, yeah thank you Patrick and Akina uh, do you see my slides yes I share okay great so I'm going to take only a few minutes of your time uh, we just announced the Visualization competition, uh, visualize this competition. Uh, so it's going to run until November 30th when the submissions are due. Uh, and the theme of this year is remote parallel rendering or distributed rendering. 
Uh, we really encourage everybody to use uh, your own data set if you happen to have a data set that is large enough that it needs visualization on the cluster. So essentially the qualifying criterion is that if you have a data set that in principle cannot be visualized on, on the laptop, it needs uh, remote parallel rendering, then it can, uh, it can be submitted to this competition. Uh, I realize that not a lot of people are doing, well, not everybody is doing very large scale simulation or have very large data sets. So we also provide a data set uh, that you can use if you don't have uh, your own large data. And this data set was kindly provided by Joshua Brinkenhoff from UBC Okanagan. And it's a computational fluid dynamic simulation of airflow around a turbine uh, blade. So it's uh, airfoil. And it was done with open form, open source project. And the data set itself is close to one terabyte in size. So it's really large. We're going to publish the links to this data set on September 30th. Uh, so we don't recommend to download it. It, it, it was put on, so we put it on, on um, CEDA, um, Gram, Beluga, and Niagara clusters. And you can just uh, use, uh, just read the data in uh, the parallel rendering tool of your choice. Um, so you will have two months to work on this data set. And I guess if you have your own da large data set that you, you can just start working right away. Uh, we have a website that is uh, provided on this slide. Uh, please go there and see all the details. So we have a brief overview of uh, the tools you can use. And also a couple of days ago, I did a webinar on batch visualization, uh, remote batch visualization on Compute Canada clusters. And there towards the end, I have a live demo of client survey interactive visualization using this precise data set on CEDA clusters. So I launched a client server um, set up on 120, uh, CEDA, 128 uh, CEDA cores. And it worked really beautifully. And I used this client server interactive visualization to uh, create a batch script. And then you can submit this batch script as a regular compute job. So if you have any questions, please uh, let us know. Go to the website, uh, send an email to me, and we'll be happy to answer any technical uh, questions. And, and Alex, probably worthwhile mentioning that, that we usually end up with some nice prizes from uh, oh, yes. we uh, do from vendors. Prizes, yes, yes. yes. So, yes. so you actually win something. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And we've had some pretty cool ones, uh, big monitors and things mm -hmm. were provided by Dell at one point. Yeah. Uh, next, our upcoming webinars. Uh, so we continue with uh, the webinar season. And uh, I already mentioned the webinar that I gave uh, earlier this week. And the next one is in mid-October uh, using the uh, Python uh, Dask library to uh, speed up your essential large data processing over, over uh, multiple cores uh, on a single node and on a cluster. And then we have a number of other seminars coming up. So each of these uh, will, uh, will take place on, on Wednesday, so every second Wednesday at 10 a.m. Pacific, uh, 11 a.m. Mountain, and so on. And uh, we have a, so there is a link to the uh, list of, online list of webinars. And what we do there is, if you click on any webinar on this website, for in an upcoming event, it will take you to the registration page. If you click on any event, on any past event, it will just take you to the recording, uh, the slides and recording uh, of this event. So it's a central single place where you can, uh, you can uh, study all the materials. Uh, we have two large events. So the first one is uh, in-person uh, training events. The first one is organized by uh, the research computing staff and Westgrid staff at the University of Alberta. Uh, so uh, again, the website is the same, uh, the same uh, link. Uh, just go slide, uh, scroll to the bottom of this page. And then you can click on the event and go to the registration page. So the University of Alberta folks are holding their regular uh, boot camp, uh, well, full boot camp event with uh, quite a lot of about 15 or so different workshops on various aspects of uh, research computing. And then we have uh, Westgrid uh, Central, organized by Westgrid Central and uh, the team at UVic, uh, Research Computing Winter School. So that's four days in mid-December at uh, University of Victoria. And if you are in Victoria or anywhere in, I guess, lower mainland uh, from Vancouver or other uh, nearby areas, feel free to register. So uh, we, we charge a small registration fee, but this is just to make sure that uh, everybody who registers uh, does attend. And so we have quite a lot of topics there. So again, please follow the, the links on the website and, uh, and, and, and register for, uh, for this event. And then finally, my last slide, uh, the user training uh, archive, uh, training materials page. So we have this page for, we've had it for, for the past couple of years. So this is the main page where we archive all our training materials and uh, lots and lots of information there. And we regularly 
updated. So there are submenus for tools, for things like visualization and uh, and and other things and uh, and uh, domains. So things like uh, well, essentially scientific computing domains. So digital humanities and uh, and molecular dynamics, astrophysics, etc. Uh, so everything is archived there, and we regularly update it. So the webinar. Uh, from uh, two days ago on batch visualization is uh, the materials are already there and the recording will be posted in probably next week uh, as well. Uh, so that's all I have. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know or just send me an email as usual. Cool. Can you go to the next slide, Alex? Just the, uh, the final slide there. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Yeah, so uh, I think that's about it for uh, this month's uh, uh, presentations. Yeah, uh, of course, support at Westgrid will uh, get you to us, and uh, patrick.man at, at uh, westgrid.ca if, uh, if you got any questions there. Yeah, so I think it's going to be a, a, nice, a nice autumn. There's lots of, uh, lots of stuff going on. Some of those uh, winter schools and the, the boot camps at U of A seem to be very, very successful. Uh, yeah, so I think that's about it. Well, and of course, the exciting part is uh, what's going to happen with the whole DRI end and and getting all some of this new infrastructure in is is uh, is really going to be brilliant. Uh, yeah, so good enough. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, yeah, I think we are we're done.